Bob's lawyer, Mary Pete. In three, two, one. And I'm with the uh, retired Winnipeg lawyer, Mary Peden, who uh, has quite uh, uh, a history, I guess I can say, in uh, in the bomber squadron uh, during the Second World uh, War. Mary and I, and our listeners would like to know uh, uh, all we can about it. It's very intriguing. Well, you say you had quite a history, uh, Frank. Actually, uh, I had what I would consider a, a fairly uh, typical sort of career, except that we had a little more experience in different fields than than most bomber pilots because uh, just by fluke more than anything else we were first uh, posted over i did some regular bombing missions as everybody did some of the mining trips we uh, most of us used to start on mining trips and then we were shipped over to uh, and attached very briefly to 161 squadron at tempsford which was the squad one of two squadrons that sir arthur harris kept all through the war uh, dropping supplies to the resistance, the French resistance and the uh, resistance fighters in Holland, Poland, you know, you name it, uh, they they went to all over the continent dropping supplies. So we had a few trips with them, and then we came back, but to bombing. But because of the type of aircraft we were flying, which was the Sterling, the first uh, big four-engine bomber that the RAF had, the Sterling was obsolescent. It had a poor altitude performance. Uh, and eventually they had to take it off. They took it off the German targets at the end of uh, 1943. We were taken off Sterling's, and then we wondered what we were going on to, and wound up uh, being posted into what was a new group then, 100 Group, which was the Radar Countermeasures Group. And in this group, uh, they were pretty tight-mouthed at first as to what we would be doing, but uh, a bunch of the Americans came along and got us converted over onto flying fortresses, and we found out that we were now taking a crew, sometimes nine, sometimes ten people, but it included, <coughs> pardon me, a German-speaking wireless operator, because one of our tasks on 100 Group was to jam the communications between the German night fighter controllers and the night fighters who were, of course, up... Uh, taking the heaviest toll they could of our of our night bombers, so we had, as I say, a sort of wide ranging uh, experience, a little wider than than most of the bomber crews. Practically all the bomber crews uh, started off with a two or three mining exercises uh, and then on to the straight bombing. We had, in addition to that, the dropping supplies to the resistance that I've mentioned, and then this radar countermeasures work, which was extremely interesting. Overseas, Mr. Peden, you were attached, uh, as many of the RCAF uh, members uh, were, to the RAF. Uh, were you on any significant raids with the RAF? Well, uh, to us, uh, they were all significant, Frank, because uh, uh, even some of the targets that were not what you would call main targets uh, could turn out to be extremely difficult if the German night fighters uh, happened to twig to where you were heading. And that was the reason, of course, uh, for the formation of 100 Group because losses in Bomber Command were steadily rising and uh, they had to do something to try and whittle down the toll that the German night fighters were taking. Who among your crew might we know here in Winnipeg? Uh, well, I just had uh, one other Canadian with me initially and that was Flying Officer J.B. Waters from Vancouver. He was my bomb aimer. Our crew initially just had uh, five people when we started off on our Wellingtons. Uh, at operational training unit, then we uh, we were enlarged to a seven man crew when you went on uh, on four engine bombers. But I still just had uh, uh, Johnny Waters as the other the only other Canadian with me. Later on, when we were on fortresses, I had another Canadian. As I say, we flew then with crews of either nine or ten, depending upon what type of operation we were flying. And I had a, a Johnny Walker, a, a Flight Sergeant Johnny Walker, an excellent gunner for my rear gunner at that stage. So we had three Canadians in the crew. Is there any one uh, incident that particularly comes to mind? Well, the worst uh, trip we did, uh, Frank, was a trip to Gelsenkirchen at the time. Uh, Sir Arthur Harris was concentrating on what they chose to call the oil plan, trying to knock out uh, the German uh, synthetic production of oil. And we were called upon to do a trip on Gelsenkirchen, which is in the center of the Ruhr. It's actually just a suburb of Essen. Uh, it was an extremely bad trip for us. We were just, just as we were approaching the target, about ten minutes away, 
uh, we were attacked by a German fighter and set on fire. Uh, we got squared away a little bit after that. Uh, we were still heading for the target, thinking that we might be able to do our job, although I didn't know initially that our German-speaking wireless operator had been wounded and his equipment was pretty badly uh, knocked about, so he probably wasn't able to carry on. I didn't know that at the time, but we carried on towards the target for another four or five minutes and then were attacked by a second German fighter who, of course, could see us from a long way away because of the fire in our starboard engine. Uh, he gave us another pasting, as I say, two members of the crew were wounded, both the wireless operator and our special WAP, as we call them, the German-speaking wireless operator. And at that stage, uh, I decided that uh, it was pointless to try and carry on any further. We had lost uh, several thousand feet by this time, and we're continuing to lose altitude, so I thought we would try and make it back to England. We kept on losing altitude for quite a long way. We Just before we got to the channel, we had settled out at about six or 7,000 feet uh, from 22,000. And we made it back to what we used to call one of the emergency dromes, a big one at Woodbridge. Uh, went in and made a crash landing there, and when I say a crash landing, it turned out to be a little bit more of that description than I bargained for, because when we landed, we found out one of our tires had been shot off, and the, we were flying a fortress when I landed the aircraft slewed very uh, radically over to the right, as you'd understand. I couldn't control it. And we went through a loaded Lancaster that was sitting there with a 12,000-pound bomb on and cut it in half. We didn't know that at the time. I only saw it half a second or so before we hit the thing and went through it. So that was, uh, yeah, that was a night that we won't forget for a little while. I guess you, you had to be a... a, a strange fellow or uh, a different kind of person to be uh, flying around in those uh, th those uh, type of planes? I don't really think so, Frank. Uh, I think they were very ordinary uh, people, truthfully. Uh, most of us, the great bulk of us, came straight out of high school. Uh, I graduated here from Gordon Bell at the end of 1941 or the middle of 1941. I wasn't 18 at that time. I had to wait until the fall, uh, until I was 18, to enlist. And I would say that uh, about three-quarters of our class at Gordon Bell uh, wound up going into the services. Some of them went into other services, of course. There were, we had people in the infantry and artillery and whatnot, tank corps, and also in the Navy and in the Air Force. More of our people, I think, joined the Air Force than the other services, but the other services all had people from our class. I wanted to talk briefly about a book that you wrote, uh, Murray, uh, A Thousand Shall Fall. How did that book come to be? Well, it started out really uh, with no intention on my part of, of making it a book. What I, I really started out writing my own experiences, which was basically, uh, Frank, to be used uh, amongst the family, so that uh, when you got the, the query, what did you do in the war, Daddy, uh, either from your children or uh, grandchildren, uh, I would say, here, you know, read this and you'll see. As I got into the thing and, and worked on it, after about a year or two, it, it kept expanding. And I finally got the idea, maybe at some stage, way down the road, uh, people might be interested uh, at some stage in learning uh, what sort of training was the standard kind of training giving, given to young people who came out of school and went into the Commonwealth Air Training Plan, which, as you know, was an immense undertaking. And I thought that it might uh, it might be of some historical interest, you know, 50 or more years down the pike, if people knew that this was the kind of training. To me, it was always uh, the most remarkable thing in the world that they could take people like me, who never had his feet off the ground, and a year after I joined the Air Force, uh, less than a year, I guess, I, I was... Uh, given my commission and my pilot's wings and uh, classified as a, a service graduate pilot. After we got overseas, of course, we took a lot of additional training, but I was uh, I thought that it would be of some interest to, to set that down. So the book kept expanding and expanding, and by the time I finished up, I finished up at about 500 pages. 
So if anyone wants some good reading, it's A Thousand Shall Fall by Murray Peden. Murray, undoubtedly some of your comrades are out there listening to this uh, broadcast at the moment. Would it, is there anything you'd like to say to them on this VE day? Well, the only thing I, I, I think I could say is something we're all aware of, that uh, at this time most of our thoughts go back to the, the friends we had with us that, that died over there and didn't come back with us. And uh, on occasion like this, you can't help thinking of uh, the wonderful people who didn't come back, Frank. A most interesting interview, indeed. Uh, yesterday we uh, had a medley of tunes, I think it was yesterday, either that or the day before, by Max Bygraves from the four years. Uh, he served in the British Air Force, the RAF. I uh, thought we'd do another one for you right now. Here's Max Bygraves. Oh, what more can I say? 